So good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, my name is Jonas Gurel. I will talk a bit about uh, an international collaborative work that we are currently in. Uh, we call it the Nordic List, and it's, it's a tool for publication analysis that I will tell you more about. So my position is I'm an analysis at the Swedish Research Council with the responsibility of basically analyzing the Swedish research system and putting it in an international context. Um, the Swedish Research Council is the main funder of fundamental research in Sweden. Uh, and we also have a responsibility in giving policy advice to the Swedish government and our ministry. Uh, so we work a lot with analyzing the Swedish research system. Uh, we work with indicators, developing in indicators, and also trying to benchmark how well Sweden are doing in comparison to other countries. Uh, we are well aware of this, uh, that this is a difficult area. We are well aware of the different complications related to indicators and stuff like that. But still there's a strong request for this, and we, we need to in some way, well, Basically, we need to use some sort of indicators in order to make comprehensive um, reports on Swedish research. Um, so these are the sort of overall questions that we are dealing with. Um, in general, the, the goals for Swedish research is that we have a lot of focus on quality and we have a lot of focus on collaborations. Uh, Indicators or measures that we use in order to evaluate our research are publication volumes, how much we actually publish. Uh, we use citations and, and impacts, uh, and also external fundings uh, are commonly used as sort of an indicator of, of quality. Um, when we analyze the Swedish research system, in short, you could say that we are leading internationally when it comes to the amount of researchers that we have in our community, um, related to our population, of course. Um, we also know that we spend a lot of money on research in Sweden, both from the, from the government side, but also from the private sector. But we know also that we are not in a leading position when it comes to impact of our publications. If you look at citation and citation impacts, we are slightly below where we would like to be. And therefore, there's a focus on measuring these things, trying to analyze why this is, how can we improve it, and so on. So one of the tools that we use are bibliometrics for this. And typically, we use the um, Web of Science database as a data source. Uh, but we know that this is not an, an optimal case for us. So therefore, we have constructed uh, something called Svepub, which is a national database of Swedish publications, and this is run by the National Library of Sweden. Um, this is basically to increase the, the coverage of publications in relationship to the Web of Science, for example, where we know that we have sort of dark spaces for when it comes especially to humanities and social sciences. So the, the Natural Library sort of harvests data from the local repositories of different universities in Sweden, and puts all of this together, and this is the data source that we eventually would like to use in order to do bibliometrics. Now, the problem with this is that when they harvest the data from the universities, they get a lot of things that we don't want to include in our analysis. This could be stuff like newspaper articles, it could be debate articles and stuff like that that researchers publish, but which we would not like to consider as being a scientific publication. So therefore, we would like to have some sort of a publication channel register, some sort of way of filtering this data to only get out the actual good scientific work that we want to use for our analysis. Now, if you look at these sort of channel registers, um, you have them in other countries. The most famous one is perhaps the Norwegian list, where they have a, a, a list of good peer-reviewed uh, publication channels. Uh, you have similar lists in Finland, and you have a similar list in Denmark as well. We don't have one in Sweden yet, but this is uh, one of the parts of, of this ongoing work. So the idea with the Nordic list is basically to put all of these lists together and aggregate them into one, um, sharing the sort of evaluations that have been done in the, in the different countries, and also to include the channels that Swedish researchers use um, 
but are not mentioned in the national lists of the other countries. So that is the basic idea. And the focus here is on peer review, that we want to only include channels which have a sound and good peer review process. So just a quick word about how this is, is done in practice. So you have a pre-existing list, and once in a while, an author would like to publish themselves in a channel that is not in this list and has not been evaluated. So what happens is that they can uh, basically request an evaluation. Um, this can be done through a web interface uh, within the Nordic list. Um, this information is sent to some sort of an administrator, which then collects a number of information uh, guidelines from the publisher or from the author, trying to answer a few basic questions. Is this uh, publication channel related to a good peer review process? Does it have a scientific editorial board? Is it open access? Is it a local publication channel? Or is it international? And so on. Uh, based on this, you can put together some basic information, and this is then sent to a number of happy researchers, divided into expert panels um, according to, the, to their actual subject. So the research, researchers themselves determine whether or not this is a good publication channel. Is it peer-reviewed? Is it a serious actor in this field? Um, and these results are then fed back into the database, and in this way, this sort of continuously grows uh, with a number of 100 channels per year or so. So now we are in the process of constructing sort of a web, web interface where you can apply for these evaluations, and you can also see the, the gather the information from the different countries, which each country's individual score of these publication channels, and a few other labels. Um, I hope that I won't offend anybody from Norway, Denmark, or Finland with this slide, because this is, I hope, correct. I've tried to compare how, how these lists are used in the different countries. Um, and I think that one of the critical differences is that in Denmark, Finland, and Norway, these lists are used for sort of scoring universities uh, and using this for funding allocations of their, of their, of their grants. This is not something that we would like to do in Sweden at the moment. Uh, we basically want to use this as a, as a tool for analysis and not for funding allocations. Um, in the other Nordic countries, they also use a number of different levels that they can assign to the different publication channels. Zero being non-scientific, one and above being scientific. Um, and this level are then entered into the model when they calculate this sort of performance score based on, based on their publication patterns. Uh, they, different countries reevaluate these levels on different intervals. Uh, like I said, in Sweden, we want to just be, well, white or black, one or two. Is it scientific or is it non-scientific? In the other countries, they have sort of distribution levels concerning these different um, channels so that, for example, in Finland, 5% of the top articles are allowed to be in a level three publication channel, and the vast majority of all articles are published in a level one. Uh, so this is sort of predetermined in that way. Um, at the moment, one of the, the visions from the start was to sort of, it would be great if we could make this effective uh, we could save a lot of work by trusting each other's evaluations, and if we could make a true Nordic list with a common level assignment for each publication channel, and we would basically trust each other's evaluations. Uh, I think that today this is uh, still a bit in the future. Uh, I mean, as soon as you sort of use this for funding allocation, it's a sort of a sensitive question. Um, you don't want to rely on other people's judgments and so on. So at the moment, I think that this will be, initially at least, uh, more of a common database where you can see the different evaluations and scores and compare them and look for differences and similarities in this. So if we look at the, the different individual national lists and how they overlap, it looks something like this. 
So each of these national lists from Denmark, Norway, and Finland contain about 30,000 publication channels each. About half of those, uh, about 15,000, are commonly are evaluated in all three countries. Um, about 10,000 per country is unique for that particular country. And when we compare this to the, to the channels that Swedish researchers use, we find that we have approximately 10,000 more channels that are used by Swedish researchers, but who are not which channels are not evaluated in the other countries. Now, I should say that many of these are not scientific journals, but they are, like I said, newspapers, stuff like that, which doesn't, it, it's not a hard task to determine whether or not this is a scientific <laughs> journal, but it, it has to be done in some way. One interesting thing is to look at the, the sort of conflicts when it comes to evaluations. How often does one country conclude that the scientific journal is scientific while another country says that it's non-scientific? Um, in this graph, you can see a number of different situations. The, the, one here corresponds to the evaluation of the journal being scientific, and a zero uh, corresponds to uh, an evaluation saying that it's non-scientific. Um, and the evaluations agree to a very, very large extent, I would say. It's about 1% of the publication channels where two countries have looked at the same channel and said one has said that it's scientific and one has said that it's not. And this is also one of the true gains of this work, I think, that it sort of highlights the special cases where conflicts do arise, and it's a good reason to sort of go back to that and see how come Finland says that this is a scientific journal while we claim that it's not. Um, the, the, the actual number of publication channels in those cases is, is not large, so I mean it's a couple of hundred journals perhaps. So they might be worth taking an extra look at. So, one of the other things that we are really interested in is, of course, open access. And this is also one of the things that is sort of hard for, for me to analyze, because it, it's hard to follow up on what is actually published open access and what is not. Um, and therefore, we would like to also evaluate these channels based on open access. Now, there are a lot of these channels, and there's quite a bit of work just to evaluate them based on peer review and so on. And also doing the work concerning whether or not they are open access is, is it's a major question and it takes, would take us a lot of time. So we started to look into alternatives for this and the background is that all of these, all of these Nordic countries have fairly ambitious open access policies. Um, in Sweden, for example, we have something called the National Guidelines for Open Access to Scientific Information, which states that all publicly funded research in Sweden should be published with open access by 2025. Uh, the Swedish Research Council has a policy today claiming that if you receive funding from, from us, you are obliged to publish open access. Now, we are not the, the only funding organization with a policy like that, and there's also a number of private funders in Sweden who, who want their research to be, to be open access published. The problem is that we know that this, this is not working to, to 100%. I mean, people are receiving funding from us and not publishing open access. Um, and we sort of want to follow this development and see, do a policy like this actually drive the development in going towards more open access? Um, would it make a difference if we didn't have that policy? And if it doesn't work, what should we do instead? So this is one of the questions that we, that we want to have an answer to. You have similar policies like this in Norway and Finland and Denmark. Um, but like I said, this is not a trivial, trivial question. Um, so what we decided to do was to sort of look at the landscape. We were, of course, aware of, of the work done by the Directory of Open Access Journals. Uh, we, we had a, started a dialogue with them, trying to understand in a, in a deeper way how they worked and how their process worked and how they actually evaluated uh, journals. Um, we were impressed by their work. And it, it's a, it, it's something that would take us a lot of time to do. We are confident in that the fact that they are doing this in a good way. Um, 
so what we said was that, okay, let's use the directory of open access journals as a source of what is actually open access. So we had a discussion within the Nordic group. We decided to go together, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Norway, and together sort of partner up and sponsor the, the DOAJ, um, and really use them as the source of information when it comes to a register of open access journals. Uh, we touched upon this topic yesterday as well, and the, the, the sort of importance of making sure that these important infrastructures survive. I think that this is a, it's a good step. I think it's also a good step for <coughs> DOAJ to sort of have an increased dialogue with the people actually wanting to use their infrastructure and their data. So I, I think it turned out to be something really good. So now we have an annual funding um, to, to, to this service from all Nordic countries together. And I think that this also sort of puts some weight on the, on the commitment uh, to, to the service. And hopefully it will increase sort of their, their importance and they can use this as sort of a marketing tool for them. So in summary, the Nordic List is a joint effort between Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden to establish a list of scientific publication channels of good standards and good peer review. Um, th this work is financed by an organization called Nordforsk, uh, and it's also followed by Iceland, the Faroe Island, and Greenland. They do not have individual lists at the moment, and they are not technically extremely involved in this work, but they are, they are taking part in our meetings and discussions and are following this work. And the objection is to reduce and share the burden of maintaining bibliographic data concerning publication channels to improve and refine the data quality contained in each national database and provide for greater comparability between them, um, and to facilitate and improve analysis of research output at the national level and comparatively between the Nordic countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you at least something about Africa. And even if it's the most southern tip of Africa, South Africa, um, it's great to be here. Um, all your discussions actually have stimulated me and made me think that uh, I must come back and share with you actually what's happening in Africa in terms of um, open research, open data, some amazing work actually happening there. And we just need to connect the dots as such. But what I'm speaking to about you today is actually the role of the Academy of Science of South Africa in the research and evaluation of um, research outputs in South Africa per se. Also coming here, I had a number of empty pages of boxes that I thought I need to tick to see where are we, because being in the tip of Africa um, is really, we sometimes feel very excluded and secluded and sort of very distanced from what's happening in Europe and in the North Americas um, of the world, etc. But I'm very pleased to say that we are ticking quite a number of boxes and, and it's good for us to see that what we do, I think it's in the right direction and pushing also towards, towards the global knowledge and the impact um, that we should have in, in that regard as such. So very briefly, just stepping back for a moment and just look at the history of publishing in South Africa. It's extremely important. We're a very young system, um, actually scaringly so, and to see where we're going to and what we're doing right at the moment. Just a little bit about the National Research Foundation rating system, which I will not focus on, but I will just allude to that as, as such. And the research output policy in 2003, the first report on scholar publishing in South Africa, our 10 recommendations and how far have we progressed in terms of implementing those recommendations, and then our second report on scholar publishing in South Africa, 10 years down the line, what happened, and then just a little bit of a conclusion. So if we step back and we look at the history of scholarly publishing in South Africa, there's been a variety of initiatives in South Africa. They've been on and off, and they've been low, and they've been hot, and they've been warm, and they've been successful and unsuccessful, running across just about a century. That's why I say we're still a very young system in terms of research outputs, um, certainly. So some South African journals has a history back to early 1900s, of which the South African Journal of Science, which we publish, is now just over 100 years old. 
So there are just only one or two of those in comparison with Europe's and the Americas that says, oh, oh, but that's young and that's few and far between. But that's what we have. But in 1970, the government then um, started to support just some journals, not all the journals in South Africa. But even that seemed to be very problematic, and it actually ended by disbanding this organization that wanted to support these journals as such. So there was a whole demise uh, through a number of years, and uh, the landscape appeared to be very drought-stricken until the 21st century, when there were certainly some changes. So in 1985, the National Research Foundation, which is our main research funder um, in South Africa, established a accreditation system, which is on the one hand side very good, but highly problematic, as um, highlighted by Danny, and instigating all sorts of other practices, which is very difficult to manage and actually to sustain in our small system as such. And also looking at global and international tendencies, it's very difficult to actually adhere to them and, and to keep up. So these ratings then, so it was based on a peer review system and it looked at researchers' contributions to um, disciplines. So the ratings assessed whether they were recognized by their peers falling into very broad categories. So they were either nationally renowned or they were nationally with some international visibility or they were national and international visibility to a very high degree. So that led to uh, categories like A-rated researcher, a B-rated researcher, C-rated researcher, which is very specific to South Africa and only means something for South Africans per se, and not internationally. So that already created a particular ecosystem in terms of um, performance, in terms of... Um, of in your institution, your rating, your standing, promotion. And yes, they do get in incentivized for being rated as well. But we've just learned in our system now that this is not sustainable. And we will definitely look at something different in going forward. And it also led to young emerging researchers, PNY rating as such. So with the NRF assessment, it led to the, to the whole notion that Authors have to publish in high impact factor journals, and that it must be journals of a particular quality. So that's core to the actual assessment system. But now on the other hand, in 2003, the Department of Higher Education and Training established a research output policy, which also led to massive changes in the research system in South Africa. So what is actually being done is that there's an um, there's output subsidy for scholar publications in journals, books, and conference proceedings. So on an annual basis, you apply for accreditation. Your institution generates some funds for your institution. It never goes to the pocket of the author. It always goes to the pocket of the university. And universities deal with it very differently. They can do with that money what they want to put it so bluntly. But it's mainly um, applied for research and development in the different in institutions. So maximizing the number of research outputs was an important source of income. So there was a big carrot, it was a funding carrot, and it really led to the growth of research output in South, South Africa per se. So you have these two things. On, on the one hand side, it's the NRF um, research assessment system, which pushes quality and um, high impact factors, and you have the national system in the research output policy that pushes um, publish or perish notions. So you get the researchers that just keeps on publishing and um, just make that, that statistic actually going up quite a bit. So in this whole competing demands, we were sort of stuck in the middle to say, what do we actually do? because it is highly problematic. And there's no discrimination between the subsidy being paid for an article will be being published in an international journal or in a local journal. It's exactly the same. But it led to quite a lot of quality, um, uh, lots of questions in terms of the quality of actual journals. I just want to show you in a study we've just completed about the research output in South Africa. You can see the dark blue part at the bottom, that is the journal articles, which represents still about 89% of our research output in South Africa. 
And then conference proceedings, 7%, and books and book bad chapters, 4%. Conference proceedings, highly problematic uh, because we find actually quite a high incidency of unethical and sort of predatory practices in conference proceedings. So we're a bit concerned about that in terms of policy. We'll definitely will have to make some recommendations. But what is very interesting, if you look at the figure there on your right hand side, 1995 we had 5,500 units. And in a 10 year period to 2005, there were only increment of 1,500 research output units in the 10 year period. And when the Department of Higher Education Research Output um, Policy came into being, it shot up almost threefold. So it was definitely a huge carrot for South African authors to publish more and to rise and to make rise to, to that. But of course it did lead to some major problems, uh, major quality issues, questioning um, the evaluation of research and, ev and to evaluate research um, specifically. And then the then departments of arts and culture then commissioned the academy, which was still very young and in its infancy shoes, um, to actually conduct evidence-based consensus study. That's typical of academies and what they do. And we investigated the journal publishing system in South Africa. And what did we find? We found that the journals were diverse. And there were explosion in local journals from a, from a mere couple to currently 320 South African journals, which is massive for a small system in South Africa. So already you, you get the feeling we have to look at them and because they generate funds and we have to ask the quality questions as such. But it also showed that the primary purpose was not to communicate and document original research in a global system. It really just raised the amount of journals in in South Africa, but it was really to publish or to perish. And then the Academy was, was instructed to come up with a new framework and a strategic framework for scholarly journal output in South Africa. It led to a number of recommendations, 10 to be actually specific, and then there were three essential characteristics um, that was promoted in this report and said that that should be the, as an end goal of our work. And that is that the integrity of research results to be presented to readers, that the methodology and interpretations should be still strong, that the core role of an editor in managing an evaluation of submitted manuscripts should be underlined, and that is still the core practice of an actual journal and how it should be managed, and then the peer review system associated with evaluations. Now, just to quickly go on to the different um, recommendations that was recommended. So the first recommendation of the report said, OK, we've looked at journals, but what about books? Because the book publishing output at the time was extremely low. And what do we need to support and to enhance book publishing in South Africa particularly? So another evidence-based consensus study was brought out which looked at the book, scholarly book publishing industry in South Africa made a set of recommendations, and I think the most important thing that it has done to date, well, two important things that it has done to date, it fit into the policy, in the new research output policy, which came into being in January 2016. And what it said is that we should recognize books, that most of the most deep scholarship is actually published within books and through books, and specifically through book chapters as well. So that was implemented in the new policy, so if you publish a book in South Africa, your institution could generate about 1.2 million rand for the institu institution, which might seem nothing to you, but which, which is quite a lot of money for South African publishers and authors as such. And secondly, what was extremely important, we've developed the code of best practice. Uh, for the peer review of scholarly books. As been said in this conference so many times in the last day, is that the peer review practices differs. But what has happened now is that all our presses, scholarly presses in South Africa, has actually endorsed this document. So I think for all the international book publishers out there, and I'm looking toward my colleague there, um, we found that South African presses were extremely lowly rated and sort of off the radar. So we hope by this document we can profile at least the practices of quality that we're doing right there. We established a committee for scholarly publishing in South Africa, which meets uh, about three times a year and advises our program in which direction we should take. We have a National Scholarly Editors Forum, 
and there we discuss all the challenges, new technologies, best practices, um, and we also have a document, a national code of best practice to peer review and to um, editors. Um, it's now, we're changing it right now and it will be available very soon. We have all the National Scholarly Book Publishers Forum where the book publishers get together and they, uh, they look at um, all their challenges. I think this is a very important activity that we do. And that's a peer reviewer, uh, the peer review of journals, of the 320 journals. So what we did, we divided them in groups, broad subject groups. We um, asked the editors of those different subject groups to complete a whole questionnaire. They hate us for it because it's extensive, it's in depth, because that's our one data set they collect about the journals. Then we asked two peer reviewers to actually review a particular journal. That was quite problematic right in the beginning because peer reviewers are used to peer review manuscripts and not peer review journals in its entirety. Um, so there was a lot of education that we had to do and to tell them it's okay, you can actually do this and they are doing it now actually quite easily as such. And um, then we have a peer review panel which sits and then look at these two data sets that we have accumulated and they form their own consensus view on a particular journal. They make recommendations. Um, we either say, well, it should be accredited by the Department of Higher Education and Training or it should be included in our CLO South Africa platform, which I will go on to just now. Um, just for your information, that Portugal is also participating in the CLO project, so there's a CLO Portugal as well. Um, that's part of the network. So as you can see, we have reviewed half of the journals thus far. It's published openly it's for everybody to see, for government, for policy makers, for editors, for institutions, and they look at the recommendations as such. So there's a wide field that we have already done, and there's still some more work to do. We're rolling out this last lot of panels, education, politics, mathematics, and then more um, panels to be established in economics and business management, and then just our fruit salad of the last bit of journals that has um, been added to the pool lately. So CIELO, what does CIELO stand for? It stands for the Scientific Electronic Library Online. It's a platform of high quality, open access, full text journals in South Africa. So this is a mechanism that we created for journals to be added to this platform. And if you're in the network, um, you are expected to adhere to very high quality standards and you are also expected to evaluate your journals on a regular basis to make sure that they still comply to the actual quality criteria that has been set, not only in the network, but on country specific as well. And sometimes when I get desperate and I think, why are we doing this? Um, I'll just continue a little bit, and I'll show, sorry, I just want to show you just one thing more. So what are our, um, our quality criteria for a journal to be included onto this platform? So it must be the Department of Higher Education and Training accredited. It must receive a positive evaluation by the ASAF peer review panel. Journal is full text and open access, and the journal publishes on time and at least 12, 12 articles per annum. Our publication rates per journal are extremely low in South Africa, so we have to push very hard to get that activity up. And articles have to have a DOI, and we subscribe actually on behalf of our journals for DOIs, um, which, has to, which has proved to be invaluable and has pushed the statistical rates and the usage of these journals up to quite a high notch. And the journal should encourage authors to include the org ID. So you can see by all the all the logos and the tabs we have there on the right-hand side, that is what we adhere to. And because we set the example, we expect journals in South Africa to follow suit. I think the most important thing for us participating in the CLO South Africa project are twofold. The one is, is by policy. If your journal is included in the CLO South Africa uh, platform, you are automatically accredited, so which is quite a plus for the academy and for the system as a whole. Secondly, all the CLO journals has its own CLO citation index, thank you. And that feeds into the web of science. Um, that is major and that is massive. So in the t this platform was started in 2009, so almost 7 million articles viewed globally via CLO South, South Africa to date which is enormous for only 65 journals being on the platform. 
To ensure quality, we, go, we push a lot of things. We have established some criteria for journals to adhere to. It's a tick list that they can look at and they can evaluate themselves whether they are complying. This is really just very a, a technical side of things and not actually the content side of things. We do a number of roadshows. We, in, we are investigating the article processing charges in South Africa. We find that there's some commercial open access publishers in South Africa that is starting to ask just as much as our European and, and, and um, states counterparts. We are a director of open access journal ambassador for Southern Africa. We assist in evaluating the journals. We're ORCID ambassador. We help journals to go open in OJS, and we have a number of um, webinars. Just to share with you a little bit the South African Journal of Science, um, we are now in a um, phase, what we call, that we, um, we try and raise the bar for scholarly publishing through striving for greater openness and quality per se. We are an e-only journal. We um, left the print, which was quite problematic or challenging because, you know, we're an academy with aged uh, members who would like to receive the copy every year, and we just had to say, well, sorry for you guys, we will go electronic only now. So it has been quite a journey, um, and we like to set the example as said. Um, Double-blinded peer review, we have started to um, put our feelers out for open peer review, and we allow what our guidelines said that um, if you publish your article in a repository, or so, um, then it's not original research and that you've actually published it anyway. We've changed it now. So you are to allow to put your preprints in a repository. You must just include the comments on your um, article uh, when you submit to our journal. And you must indicate that you have incorporated that to be then viewed as a new research or a new contribution of your actual manuscript. Last week was peer review week, and we put our toes into that troubling water, and we asked our um, authors, so what do you think about open peer review? Can we publish to the reviewers? Can we do, do this, and can we do that? So we'll see what the outcomes are. You can see again by all the badges, all the services that we subscribe to, um, Portico, Crossref, um, Crossref is quite, um, quite an amazing system for us to belong to because that has upped our game tremendously. And we talk a lot about that with the editors as such. Our views and downloads for transparency, you can see our output is in, in multiple um, formats, etc. cetera, um, just to make sure that, that we also understand the different um, formats and, and how it works for us. At one stage, we thought we should not do EPUB. It's quite expensive for us. But looking at the statistics we're generating nowadays, we said, no, the market is ready for that. Let's continue. Being E has been quite a journey, and to do E distribution and E marketing, etc., and we have grown from something like 600 print subscribers to um, 27,000 subscribers to our um, E distribution list, which is massive and proves to be quite valuable. Again, we are indexed by all those services. We also have the seal of approval of DOAJ. We are also experimenting with open journal systems right at the bottom, and I couldn't get it in, and that's a South African Crime Quarterly, publishes huge amounts of data sets alongside its journal. So we are assisting and helping them. We will be moving all these journals, including South African Journal of Science, to OJS3 from 1st of January. This is a very important study that we concluded after the 10 years of the research output, the first research output policy, to say where are we going. So our journal output by journal list Web of Science, 62% of South African pu academics published in journals indexed in Web of Science. South African journals, 35%, and IBSS, 9%. Those are the three accredited lists. I think this, what this whole study brought to us, and if you think about what I've been saying about the amount of work that we've actually put in, is um, that this was a, the biggest revelation, uh, revelation for us, and it has showed us that our strategies in South Africa particularly has been spot on and very important and that we should continue with them um, and actually just up our game. And I'm almost done, Mr. Chairperson. Just, if I can just have a second more, I'll be grateful. Um, so if we look at the share of South African research in publications in the top 10% cited worldwide, South Africa occupies 7.1% of that 10%.
And if you look at the top 1% cited worldwide, South Africa occupies 0.6%. So South African authors occupy a large percentage of the highest cited papers um, in the world, which is quite important for a small system and a challenging system like ours. I'm not going into the other findings. Everything just went up. The country where I come from, gender race is very important. More collaborations, we are, we are participating in quite some large collaborations like the CERN Hydro um, 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 research that they're doing right there. And of course, in the system, there is an emergence of unethical and predatory practices. Still very small and very low, but we have to nip it in the butt while it's still very young in its unethical practices. So we will start focusing on that more and do more training with um, DVC's research, directors of research, research officers of the um, universities, etc. My last slide, uh, what was the impact of the reports, is that the report provided a rich environment in which scholarly publishing in a variety of modes can be performed. So the quality of the work is maintained, we try and ensure that, and that authors in the current challenging milieu, they are the beneficiaries of comprehensive interventions, as I've just showed you. And that South Africa is one of the few countries, I think, that benefits from a comprehensive intervention from government that supports scholarly activities. I thank you very much. I'm grateful to our chairman, Lars, uh, to have invited me here as an outsider uh, in this field. Actually, when Caroline Sutton had this nice idea that we should shake hands of a person that we haven't met yet at this meeting, I could have shaked hands with everybody except one at this meeting. <laughs> and this is the first time in my life by, that I have been at a meeting like this. And it's a wonderful audience, uh, very different from what I talk to normally. And um, you may ask uh, why I'm here. Well, uh, I'm not involved in journals with open uh, access publishing very much, but I am involved very much with assessment of research and researchers. I've been 10 years on the research council of the National Research Council of Switzerland. I've been for 17 years chairman of appointment committees for professors at ETH Zürich. And now I'm a member of the Presidium of the German Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, where we also try to select, of course, the very best. So evaluation and assessment of researchers and research is a key issue. Uh, perhaps I should say not everybody knows what ETH stands for. Uh, it's Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule. Nobody can pronounce that here except a few. Um, uh, it's really a Swiss university for science and technology, and I can honestly say uh, this university tries to do the very best for the Swiss academic uh, education and research, and we try to also hire the very best people. That's our serious goal, and I have been involved in that goal for some time. Uh, now, um, the reason why I, what I should talk about is actually prop, uh, due to Stuart Taylor, whom I met in my function on the uh, Academy of Science Leopoldina, He's, of course, from the Royal Society here, and he's the only person whom I knew beforehand. And he knew probably about a lecture I gave, and he, that appeared in writing, I gave as president of the Bunsen Society in uh, 2012. Um, and I, of course, you can't really, I can't really present all of this, uh, but you can get it from our website. Go to our group website. Uh, our research papers can be downloaded there as PDF freely. It's open access on a private level. And of course, this particular paper also, it has appeared, in the meantime, it has appeared the speech for, in five versions because it found much interest. But this version is one that perhaps you want to download from our website. Uh, it is on missed challenges, risks, and opportunities. Um, and it may provide some contrast to some of the things that you have heard today. Uh, so, I will start with a little introduction in uh, the management, uh, governance of science, autonomy, democracy, sophocracy, axiocracy, uh, in the Republic of Science, as opposed to what I would call bureaucracy and robotocracy. Uh, then I uh, will make a case for good practice in evaluation and uh, 
of research and researchers and the risks of some recent bad practice that we are confronted with. Uh, we'll talk about some myths, bureaucratic superstition, good practice in publishing, a document of three academies, three national academies, and perhaps in the end, if there's time, um, I will talk about the why, what are the real reasons for fundamental research and its support, because after all, publishing is based on this. Well, uh, the autonomy in the Republic of Science ideally is uh, a self-governance. Uh, people, experts, uh, it's a democracy with competence-weighted right of vote. So experts decide, a group of experts, that's why it's sort of a democracy, uh, not a single one decide on things they know, a topic they know about. Uh, the greatest danger is the alternative bureaucracy that people without any expertise on the topic decide on the basis of secondary information. And we know this kind. Indices, impact factors, quantitative measures, gut feeling, even horoscopes are used by some bureaucrats. Um, and this brings me to the case uh, I want to make today. Uh, to stand up, really, it's really necessary for, to stand up for good practice in science and speak out against bad practices. Uh, good practice means evaluation of scientific content by competent and trustworthy experts, and the bad practice is evaluation by indices, for instance, age index, numbers of publications in high impact journals, and so on. Such bad practice really leads to the corruption of science and scientists. Um, I just give an example, a very recent study I was confronted with in a case, actually, um, where I learned about this paper that was just recently published. It's uh, from Chinese scientists, published or impoverished. Uh, they investigated the cash rewards given uh, for publications in some journals, high and lower impact journals, and a typical number would be $25,000 to $50,000 for a paper in Nature or Science, $3,000 for PNAS, $1,000 for PLOS One, and so on. Uh, this has impact on the behavior, I cite here from that paper, this has impact, they wrote that, on the behavior of some scientists, plagiarism, academic dishonesty, ghost-written papers, and fake peer review scandals are on the increase in China, also just mistakes, of course. The number of paper corrections authored by Chinese scholars increased from two in 1996 to 1,234 in 2014, 16. That is enormous. It's not just a Chinese problem. Uh, it creeps in everywhere. Uh, in a recent uh, price matter, I will, of course, uh, uh, anonymize this. Uh, the, a young man had a bibliography, and of course what he said, he has 90 references in the web of science. Average citations per item, 49. Age index, 35. Two in science, one in nature. And then he continued with his list. And the committee actually was a little smiling and wondered, why does this young man, who was considered for a high honor, why does he cite these strange numbers in his CV? But it happens everywhere now. I mean, all of you who are involved in this, they know that it happens. It has no meaning because we assume the, we want to study the science and not these numbers. But it happens. So this type of corruption, actually it was not used against this young man. The young man got the prize, uh, but uh, not because of it, but as opposed to it, right? So uh, perhaps going to the next point, I start with a little, uh, summarizes a little quote von Einstein, uh, an academic career in which a person is forced to produce scientific writings in great amounts creates a danger of intellectual superficiality. And today one can add in great amounts in high impact journals. Uh, that was a concept not known at Einstein's times. This is a recent concept, of course. Well, let me now cite you from some good practice, and this is what really happens, I can assure you. Um, it is, as I, I on purpose, just don't tell my own experience by sight from a colleague at Stanford University, a chemist, physical chemist like me. Uh, he wrote, uh, what, how do they select their faculty? First of all, they must be good departmental citizens. I shall come back to this point too. Second, they must become good teachers. Third, they must become great researchers. The last criterion is the most difficult. And I can underline very similar criteria are used in appointments at ETH. 
you see that some things that I mentioned this morning are simply missing from that list. They don't appear. What are the questions that you ask in hiring faculty? We ask experts whether the research of the candidate has changed the view of nature of chemistry, it's the chemistry department, in a positive way. It's not based on the number of papers with an algorithm on impact factor, etc. We do not discuss age index metrics and we do not count publications or rank them as to who is first author and so on. We just ask, has the candidate really changed significantly how we understand chemistry? And again, this is a citation from Stanford University and at ETH we have very similar practices. Now, there are objections against this kind of careful analysis by content. Uh, it's time consuming and expensive. So you use a shortcut and the shortcut that is very much used, of course, we know that is bibliometric data. I will like to start with an example of another evaluation that uh, many of you know, uh, perhaps this audience a little less, but when I talk to professors, they all know that. When, how do we evaluate students' exams? Well, uh, we read the exam paper, we look what is right and wrong, perhaps something original, perhaps something very stupid, and in, in the end we make a mark on that after reading and carefully assessing the content. Now this is time consuming and costly, uh, but should we replace it by a shortcut, simply counting the number of pages of the solution, which has some correlation with the quality if properly assessed? No, this would be just fraudulent, right? Every professor would be fired if he did that, right? And now this exactly is proposed to do when you evaluate now researchers. This is absurd. So uh, sometimes I get then the comment, uh, this evaluation, there's really no objective alternative to bibliometry. And here I like uh, to cite my famous close colleague, Richard Ernst, Nobel Prize in 1991. Uh, he wrote a very strong uh, essay on this topic too, uh, which is uh, in this uh, citation here. And he said, yes, there is an alternative. Very simply start reading papers instead of merely rating them by counting citations. Um, Simplicity is not a goal in itself, and this is from an even more famous person, a citation. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, now, let me come back to uh, the bad uh, citizen, uh, the good cit uh, the, uh, the uh, notion of that the scientists they hire in Stanford must be good citizens. Uh, well, you might ask, why uh, do they have this as a first rate? Well, the answer is bad citizens can damage good science. And uh, I think bibliometers, forgers, and the like are examples of bad citizens. Now let me come to some basics of evaluating and funding scientific research. Uh, a little bit on who decides about funding, how does one decide what should be funded, what is good practice, and what is the goal of research funding um, uh, what is the goal of scientific research, if I have time? Who decides? Well, these are funding institutions, and I have been involved very much, of course, with the Swiss National Science Foundation, uh, but I know quite a bit also about some of these others up down to the European Research Council, and what I find, actually, the procedures are quite different. There is a mixture of criteria, and that mixture is very different from institution to institution. Um, and I think some are better than others, but I will not go into too much detail on this. Uh, well, uh, there are three types of taking the decisions. You can make decisions by a committee, a panel of competent persons who are themselves actively involved in scientific research of the general field. Um, broad expertise, of course, is required. Uh, the decisions are made, secondly, by a group of bureaucrats. That's an alternative, which uses various combinations of indices and other measures, as well as sometimes expert assessments, gut feeling, uh, and decisions are based actually sometimes uh, on pure lottery. Uh, some people think that's not, uh, not uh, really true, but actually uh, there are some institutions that do that, it's rare, but in fact, in some granting procedures, pure lottery plays a big role, because if the, if the granting rate is very low, in the end, uh, chance plays a very big role who gets a grant. Uh, I, will not, I will skip that citation on the lottery. Um, 
let me talk about the criteria. Uh, of course, the quality of the research project proposal most frequently assessed by expert assessment. Uh, secondly, very much importance has the personality of the researcher. Of course, this is particularly important if you hire people, there the person is important. But also, in other contexts, uh, there is a quote I like uh, by Helmut Schwarz, the president of the Humboldt Foundation. He said, fund people, not projects. And of course, the third criterion are these bureaucratic indices like citation indices, total numbers of citations, age index, and so forth. Actually, Hirsch, in his paper, has seriously proposed that one should base hiring decisions, promotion decisions, tenure decisions on the age index. And this is done in some places, but I don't think it's done in good places. Uh, I come now to some of these myths on these uh, indices. The first myth is that a high rejection rate in funding schemes is a measure of high quality of the procedure. This is complete nonsense. Uh, you can easily see that. If you go to the limit of 100% rejection, then you have a system where people write proposals, they assess them, and nothing is funded. This is absurd, right? And in practice, my rule is if the, if the rejection rate goes beyond 80% or 70%, uh, the rest is pure lottery. And that's not very uh, responsible. The second myth that is very widely spread, actually was even quoted here, I have to say, several times, that citation numbers are an adequate measure for the importance of a scientific public publication. Actually, scientists who have been in the field for a long time know this as pure nonsense. And I give one example. The Weinberg Nobel Prize paper, which is a cornerstone of the standard model in particle physics. He wrote that as a young man uh, when this was time for new funding for him and tenure decision and so forth. This paper, uh, which is, uh, has the title, A Model of Leptons, it's one of my favorite papers in science, uh, was not cited at all in the first years after publication. It has contributed zero to the impact factor of that journal. If the editor had decided on the on the number of citations, he should have rejected that paper. But of course they didn't. They, actually, the people tenured Weinberg, they knew he was a brilliant <laughs> physicist. And of course, after some time, that paper was recognized. Why? The, in the first years, he had actually had also this question of self-citations. Uh, in the first years, many of his citations, of the few citations, were self-citations. Why that? <laughs> Simply because nobody else, or very few, worked in the field. Salam, of course, worked in the field. There are few who cited him, but uh, he self-cited him very substantially because there was not much else. Well, uh, another one, the impact factor of a journal is derived from citation statistics of the first years after publication is a measure of the quality. So in that sense, science would be a good journal with this enormous impact factor. Well, we just saw from individual papers that's not true. Uh, now people say, okay, it may not be true on individual papers, but if you make this statistical average over a whole journal, then it makes sense. The fact is, these extremely high impact journals are not even satisfying some, uh, some of the primary criteria for good publishing, as they have just last year been summarized by three national academies, uh, the Académie des Sciences, the Leopoldina, and the Royal Society. Uh, I highly recommend that document. It's a four-page short document. You all should read that. Uh, I have given here a reference, but you can find it on all the websites and even on the European Communion uh, website. Uh, with, here it's with a commentary. Uh, what is, I cannot quote much from this. We encourage journals to operate objective peer review, which emphasizes scientific quality, methodological rigor, and statistical soundness over potential impact, novelty, and fashionability. This is the opinion of three major national academies. Um, and they also say, it's a literal quote, uh, principles that are already in use by many journals, but which are neglected by some of the highly prestigious ones, are these high impact journals, and deliberately ignored by many newer online journals of low reputation and readership. Um, what are the principles? Efficient and high quality dissemination of scientific information, the avoidance of all forms of conflict of interest, necessity to ensure fair reviewing of articles, and keeping the handling and decision making processes regarding scientific articles entirely under the control of well recognized scientists as experts. 
Uh, it also is stated in that document, we support open access and uh, would like to see all published scientific work freely available under fully open licenses. Uh, that's from this academy document. Myth four, I go quickly now. The so-called Hirsch index is a suitable measure for the importance of quality of a scientist. Uh, it's complete nonsense. I will not summarize it here. Richard Ernst, my direct colleague in our institute, uh, he has published a very short one-page article on this, just uh, destroying this whole idea. Um, actually, there's another myth uh, which also has been mentioned today already, uh, that the amount of research funding a person gets is a measure of the quality of the research and the researcher. Uh, that myth is also nonsense. Uh, well, you might make such a, it is really used uh, actually by some funding agencies. Um, uh, you might uh, take the sum of acquired research funds is divided by, of course, the number of scientists that, that you get this funding importance. If you really think about funding, actually it would be much better to get with a little money a lot of scientific knowledge. So uh, this, the sum of finances should be in the denominator. It should not be in the, in the numerator. Uh, and uh, the problem is, of course, it would have not been necessary to measure scientific knowledge, uh, which is not easily done without, with an index. Now I will perhaps conclude with a word, if I'm, if I'm allowed to, on, uh, on why do we do scientific research. I mean, I would like to conclude particularly because of the first lecture where the sociology of science was discussed. I think this is very serious and comes from a commencement speech I gave a number of perhaps 15 years ago. Uh, we do it for the personal satisfaction and discovery of knowledge, a contribution to, to the edifice of knowledge of mankind, uh, and directly and indirectly to contribute to improving the conditions for human life and mankind. Now, this first, uh, the first motivation is very old. Uh, my favorite citation is from Democritus, Bullus time malon mian heurein ideologian eten person. He, the scientist philosopher, would rather like to make a single fundamental discovery than become the king of the Persians. Um, I will skip that quote, perhaps, and perhaps go to the next uh, reason. Uh, what, there is an objective reason. Uh, the objective reason is the need of society for good research. And that's a quote from myself. The support of fundamental science, I severely believe, uh, fundamental scientific research can be considered to be the greatest opportunity of all investments of mankind in their future. This, and this is an objective reason why society should fund research. And I give one example uh, for this. This is the Schrödinger equation. It's related to Switzerland and Zurich. Um, the Schrodinger equation is known to physicists and chemists. It's one of the basic equations of quantum mechanics. It was actually discovered in Arosa on a ski holiday over Christmas 1925-1926. Uh, it was not funded by anybody. It was pure theoretical research. Nobody thought at that time of any practical application. Uh, today, it is estimated that in modern societies, industrialized societies, about 20% of the cross-national product is based on quantum mechanics of which Schrodinger equation is a part. Another older example is Faraday. Uh, when he studied electricity and magnetism in the 19th century, he was asked by Lord Gladstone uh, what these gadgets were good for. And he said, I don't know, Lord Gladstone, but I know for sure one day you will tax it. And of course we know today electricity <laughs> and magnetism is everywhere. Uh, with this, I conclude. I conclude with this slide. Uh, this is Arosa, where the Schrödinger equation was found without funding by a professor who got his salary. He was hired according to the old procedure of selecting excellence, and he worked, of course, during his holiday instead of just only skiing. Uh, there's also some gossip around this holiday. And this is very nearby to the place where the Schrödinger equation was found, the Berg Kreschli in Arosa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin, uh, for an inspiring talk. Uh, we have a few minutes left before the uh, coffee break, but uh, please, questions to our three panelists. 
I don't think anyone here would disagree with you that bibliometric indexes are not the right way to evaluate researchers, scientists. But I have a question, which is that you seem to assume that the alternative is objective assessment by experts. And we know from social science research that that also leads to bad science because of unconscious bias. So that you know, research becomes more and more homogenous, fewer women, fewer newer entrants, because experts are not neutral. They're not objective. So yes. what's the solution? Yes, I haven't. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I have an answer to that. Actually, when you read the written document, you will find the answer I write on good practice. The way to do that, we know that. And of course, if you have been on committees for appointments, you know exactly this bias. And the way to do it is you compose a committee. So that's why I say it's a, a sort of democracy. The committee must be large and broad enough to exclude personal bias. Uh, if there is personal bias, which always exists of one individual or two, there are always enough others to compensate for that. And so there are procedures to avoid that. I have a question about the Nordic list. Um, in our research institutions, we are all making now quiz systems, and the measure for a good journal is um, the listing in Web of Science and Scopus um, databases, which are highly expensive. And I wonder whether you have ever considered to expand this idea in sort of the South, so making some, something international about this common idea. I'm sure there is a big administrative burden, but it would be a great benefit if we would be independent from the other databases and made even better measurements for journals. This is sort of a first step in doing this in a truly international way. And uh, like you said, what we want to do is to, to lower this administrative burden on this. Um, uh, how to combine it with commercial services, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, basically, we, we as a funding organization and also a lot of, of institutions and universities have subscriptions to the Web of Science and stuff like that, which cost a lot of money. And in the, in the, in the end, if we, wanna, if we wanna be effective and cost efficient, we wanna sort of lower our dependence on these services in the end. I have uh, another question for the Nordic list. Uh, I, I'd like to understand or know uh, how to you address the question of uh, using uh, closed lists for evaluation, closed list of journals, the potential that it has to freeze the innovation in the scientific research and publication sector, as it makes it almost impossible for researchers to create new journals because when they create those new journals, open access, let's say with the OGS, they are not on the list, so they cannot attract researchers and authors to publish in their journal because they are not on the list. I'm sure you have, you have a solution for that. Thank you. So sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear you for the whole question, but if I understood it correctly, it's about how to treat new journals. Yeah. So, like I said, the, the, the different countries have sort of different intervals for re-evaluating journals that are already on the list. Uh, however, the, the process of requesting an evaluation and actually getting into the list is, is continuously ongoing. So, I mean, pretty much as soon as an, a researcher uses a publication channel, they, are, they have the possibility to submit that journal to us and we will have a look at it. But of course, if you want to if, if you, if you want to be included in the list, you need to have all sort of proper documentation and processes in place. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for Susan. Uh, you were mentioning that the preprints uh, that you're allowing people to publish in preprints, and then if there were comments that those needed to be incorporated to say that this had been changed. But what happens if there are no comments? I think that just has to be disclosed by the author as such, and then it will just move on to the South African Journal of Science and peer review process as such. So it's, it won't hold them back. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have a question or a comment rather on the, on the last presentation from, from a sort of a funding organization point of view. 
which is, um, I mean, it's interesting the things that you discussed, Martin, about how to distribute funding and so on, and how not to use these sort of sheep indexes and so on. And we, we are, of course, aware of that, even though we use them sometimes. I should point out that we don't use impact factors and we never evaluate individuals on, on bibliometric measures. We, so we do it on an organizational level and so on. But one of the interesting things, at least in Sweden, is that, I mean, you distribute sort of base funding to the different universities and then they have the freedom to distribute that money within their own organization. And my impression in Sweden, at least, is that those systems where the research, researchers are typically more in charge, they are much more, uh, they, they use these sort of indices much more than we do from a national standpoint. I don't know if you share this. Uh. Well, this is the reason for the worry, right? If I were assured that in all places people wouldn't use these indices, I wouldn't talk about it. But I wanted to make the point, uh, in serious good places, it is not used or very little used. It depends also on the department. I can tell you, of course, I have a long experience. Uh, we chair uh, for other departments, so not for, uh, you never a uh, chairman as ETH, you chair not for your own department in order to remove the bias. But so I have seen all the other departments and I know in mathematics and in physics, there is zero use of these indices, for instance. In biology, there is some, but of course, as a chairman, I always stopped it. Uh, so. Uh, I, I can tell you what I did. When a person on our committees, who are all experts, when uh, he or she said, this guy has uh, 10 or 20 papers in science and nature and has so many citations, I immediately asked as chairman, as a neutral chairman who is not an expert, now I would like to get an explanation what exactly is the scientific achievement in these particular papers. And never got I from this person a proper reply. So basically, the opinion was ruled out from the committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid the discussion will have to continue between the participants and the panel, and between the panelists during and after the corporate break, which we'll have now. Um, please join me in uh, appreciation of the contributions of, from the panelists. <laughs> <laughs>